mercy are yours, God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, my dear friends. It's hard to believe, but four years ago, two days ago, I stood here before a group of Wells pastors and a whole bunch of you to be installed as your new pastor. Now, I'm sure many of you, as I was standing there making my ordination vows, my installation vows, you were wondering what you had gotten yourself into. And I have to admit, I was probably thinking about the same thing. But here we are four years later, and as I reflect back on those installation vows each year, I am still humbled and intimidated by them. I'm humbled by the fact that you called me to be your pastor, even though I am probably far less seasoned than many of you here in this congregation. I'm also intimidated and humbled, realizing that I am a weak and sinful human being who has made plenty of mistakes as a pastor, as a father, as a husband, as a friend. And I know, unfortunately, that I am still going to be making plenty of sinful mistakes. And I wish I could be a perfect pastor, a perfect counselor, a friend, and a perfect Christian. But I know that's not to be. And so the very next Sunday after I was installed, the very first sermon that I delivered here was called Great Expectations. It was the great expectations that I have a feeling many of you had in getting a new pastor. And many of those expectations, unfortunately, I have failed at. But I also focused that day more primarily on our Savior and the expectations that were placed upon him. Well, today we take a slightly different angle and we see the expectations that our Heavenly Father had placed upon the Savior of the world. The expectations that this true God and true man in the flesh would carry out as he would bring salvation to this world. Those pretty harsh expectations our Father, our Heavenly Father had of him. And so today we see what amounts in some ways to Jesus' introduction, maybe you could even say his installation into public ministry, that occurred at his baptism, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. and Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love with him I am well pleased. Now, with this lesson, we've come a long way from where we were just a few short weeks ago, seeing that little baby lying wrapped in swaddling cloths in a manger. And when you really think about it, the scriptures remain pretty silent about the first 30 years of our Savior's life here on earth. And while maybe we have a bit of an unhealthy fascination about what Jesus was doing for those first, first 30 years, the scriptures really give us everything we need for our salvation. And if you're still wondering, if you're still wanting to know what Jesus was up to those first 30 years, I guess you'll just have to wait to get to heaven and then you can ask him yourself. But not to make light of the fact that for those first 30 years of Jesus' life, he knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew exactly who he was and what was coming in his life. For those first 30 years of his life, he knew that he had to obey his Father's will and obey each and every one of the commands that God had given in the Old Testament. He could not make one mistake. He could never have one single second of sin enter into his heart and into his life. Now that's a pretty amazing feat considering how pervasive and overbearing those laws of Moses really are. 
pretty amazing when you consider the fact how pervasive sin and temptation are in this world, and yet Jesus never failed once. But now, as Jesus entered into the Jordan River area, at the age of 30, an age which was often associated with being mature enough to be a community leader, to be a spiritual leader, Jesus' ministry kicks into full gear. In some ways, Jesus' baptism, there is a link, a connection between the old and the new. You see, John the Baptist, in many ways, was the very last prophet that was getting people ready for the promised Messiah. It was John's mission and ministry to point people to someone far greater, the greatest prophet. The greatest teacher the world has ever seen was about to appear. And now, with Jesus' arrival, John's ministry in some ways was fulfilled. Jesus was there. The Messiah had arrived. And John's mission and ministry in many ways fades into the background as Jesus' ministry and mission now takes center stage. And yet we see here that even at this point, John the Baptist even had his own doubts. You see, we like to put John the Baptist up on a pedestal, but John the Baptist was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. John the Baptist was certainly a product of his own generation, and he carried with him the same baggage that the people did when it came to the false expectations of the Savior. John didn't always understand Jesus' role in that plan of salvation. Like many in his world during that time, the false expectation they held was this, this preoccupation, this false idea, this rumor that there was going to be an earthly king and earthly kingdom. John the Baptist certainly didn't always get his cousin Jesus and what he was here to accomplish. And yet on the other side, John recognized that this man, Jesus, was far different than anyone else he had ever met before. In fact, you go all the way back to when John was still a baby inside the womb of his mother. He leaped for joy just being in the presence of Mary, who had Jesus in her womb. And now as Jesus stood before him in the River Jordan, he recognized the one who was far greater than he. He recognized that this man had perfect obedience and perfection unlike anything the world had ever seen. No one could ever measure up to him. And for that reason, in some ways, John has to confess his unworthiness, his doubt, his sinfulness. As we read, he tried to deter Jesus from being baptized and said to him, I need to be baptized by you. Can you come to me? See, John, like many of the prophets before him, recognized that standing in front of the most holy God, he didn't deserve to be there, that he was an unworthy servant. Like Moses at the burning bush, or a pastor, or church council members who are installed before a congregation as a member of this sin-sick human race. We have to confess with Isaiah, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Sinful human beings, we have to admit that we haven't always met the expectations of our God for us. Living in this sin-sick world, we are saturated by its filth, and we haven't always done a a very good job of representing his name to those around us. And often we have also had those unholy expectations of our Savior. We falsely assume and expect that Jesus is just going to overlook sin, that he's going to cover up all of our sin, that he's going to be that buddy Jesus who doesn't really take his expectations all that serious. But unfortunately, if this is how we treat our relationship with Jesus, 
then why shouldn't we expect him to punish us, to cast us out of his presence forever? Why should we expect that he should show us any mercy for all the times we have behaved much more like the devil's children than our Savior's children? Why should we expect anything good from him? Well, that's where this all turns around. Because the amazing thing about all of this is what the world was waiting for, what the world was expecting had now arrived. And John the Baptist, as he stood there, recognized that this man was no mere man coming out to be baptized in the Jordan River. But standing before him was the most patient and merciful God, the God who had come to bring mercy and peace to his ungrateful, impatient, unloving, and sinful children just like you and me. And it would be Jesus' mission and his ministry to bring people all people from every nation on earth back into God's presence to live with him forever in heaven. Now after all those long years of waiting, all those expectations, all those endless seemingly sacrifices that were offered, it had now arrived. The wait was over. As John would later recall, the perfect Lamb of God was now there. That Lamb that would be that perfect once and for all sacrifice to make atonement between us and our God, to make us at one with Him again. Now there were some terrifying and deadly expectations that God had for this Lamb of God. But Jesus was willing to do whatever it took. To live to die and rise again, to bring us back into God's family, to fulfill those, those seemingly impossible expectations that God had for him. Now, Luther once said that there are only two places where sin can be, on the sinner or on Christ. You see, the law has placed sin squarely on us. There is no escaping it. There is no wiggle room. If you sin, you deserve to die. One mistake, one sin, is all that it takes to keep us out of heaven. That's how extreme the law is. And that's why we so desperately need our Savior. And that's exactly what this perfect Lamb of God did. He met those expectations. He came into this world and He took our sins on Himself took them to the cross. Our Savior has done it all for us. And it's worth repeating that for those 33 years that our Savior lived among us, He did it absolutely perfectly. Our Savior had perfect obedience, the will and the plan of our Heavenly Father. And because of His perfect obedience, we now have salvation. Now the only way that all of this works is if Jesus was truly God himself. Mark my words, he is. But don't just take my word for it. We also have our God stamp of approval. We have his praise of his son. We hear that at his baptism as he speaks from heaven, this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. Even before Jesus started his public ministry, his heavenly Father was already pleased with all that Jesus had accomplished. And along with this testimony, we also have the testimony of those who saw Jesus. In fact, you see that almost right away. They recognized the power and the authority of this great man. In fact, his first disciples start calling him rabbi. This wasn't a term that they just threw around willy-nilly in those days. This was a term of respect, something that was gained after years of study, after giving authority to, be, to go out and preach. And yet they start calling Jesus rabbi because they recognize that his power and authority came directly from God. God expected the world from Jesus. And Jesus delivered the world from sin and from death. 
We have the testimony of those who saw this. We have the praise of our Heavenly Father. And now that Jesus has ascended back into heaven, he has given us expected work to do. Not to work out our salvation, because he's already taken care of that. But to go out there and share this good news of salvation with others. My dear friends, as we've entered this new year, and in a few moments we have a number of new men coming on to our church council, a number of new members here and old members alike, we have all been called to serve. And I know we're up to it. Even though at times it's going to be difficult, but there's nothing better in this world to be just like John the Baptist, to point other people to our Savior. In some ways, that's a simple expectation of us. One I know we can handle. As We share the truth with others and tell them what our Savior Jesus is really all about.